Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is July 16, 2021. And right now we're doing a marathon of Hanging with the Sock Dem Gang clips in which I critique and comment on different videos from the social democratic world. Basically, I went to the Secular Talk YouTube channel, clicked on channels that they link to, and then uh, grabbed a bunch of clips from the last couple of weeks to see what is going on over in that political ecosphere. So this is the fourth video. We did two from Kyle Kalinske and one from Tom Hartman pushing Russiagate still in 2021, like nails on chalkboard. Anyway, this guy, David Pakman, is I think one of the worst, like furthest to the right of these left liberal commentators or social democratic commentators. Um, I don't like him at all. Never have. That said, he has a guest on and the guest might say something interesting. In any case, we're here kind of to criticize, although I'm sure there will be points of agreement. But let's see what is going on in this clip. It's great to welcome back to the program Rachel Bittekoffer, who's an election forecaster and analyst, host of the podcast, The Election Whisperer, founder of Strike Pack. And I think... OK, just jumping in for a second, we see here already the social democratic obsession with electoral politics, which are never going to result even in social democracy. Um, the time when the U.S. established some social democracy in the 30s, it took so much struggle, nonviolent and violent. We went through something called the Coal Wars, C-O-A-L Wars in the 1920s, as well as, you know, the crash of 1929, et cetera, and all of the fallout from that. That's what it took to get social democracy. That plus the Red Scare in the late teens, World War I, you know, all the stuff that was going on in the 1900s, teens, 20s, and even earlier. But I mean, conditions were at rock bottom, and then you had the first socialist revolution on a national scale in Russia in 17 capitalists were really starting to, you know, worry about what to do. And uh, a faction of the U S ruling class headed by FDR instituted this kind of class peace through the working class of bone uh, instituted a framework for resolving labor disputes, etc. So this saved capitalism. It didn't end capitalism. And uh, anyway, they don't even understand their own history. It was socialists, anarchists, communists who, you know, really engaged in all the agitation that resulted in this in the first place as a movement. Um, and we wanted revolution, not FDR. You know, FDR was what the ruling class came up with to um, thwart us, basically, and to stop us radicals you know social democrats don't understand any of this they stand on the shoulders of socialists while punching down at us at the same time anyway you see all this electoral politics stuff the whole philosophy is we just need better democrats uh no that's that's not the case continuing rachel someone who is increasingly concerned about what 2022 is looking like for democrats am i right yeah, I mean, you know, if you're a trained political scientist like I am and your area of expertise happens to be campaigns and elections, voter behavior, there is no there's few uh, trends in, in that kind of research that is as um, adamant, as robust, as continuous as the midterm effect. So, you know, even before I mean, literally, as uh, a Biden, Biden was walking across the stage and getting inaugurated, the fundamentals of this cycle are, are against the Democrats. So, you know, given what happened in 2020, not only where they structurally had this huge fundamentals advantage, but then the events of 2020 could not have set up a challenger uh, trying to oust an incumbent better than Joe Biden in that fight. Right. Seeing, seeing the Democrats unable to capitalize on that down ballot and not just because it's something that happens, right? Like it's something you have to make the conditions for and they did not do that, right? Uh, we have a I'm just going to interrupt for a second here. Um, I'm not disagreeing with anything that she's saying. I just want to point out the title of this video is Dems should be panicking about 2022 and 2024. 
I don't disagree with that. Uh, I'm not a Democrat, and I don't recommend that people become Democrats. The Democratic Party is a 1% party. It's controlled by the same people who control the Republican Party as far as the big, big capitalist donors. That's who rules the United States. That's who owns the United States, and they own the political parties, the Democrats and Republicans. Both of them, it's a two-party system, but they both serve the same masters. You can't get change for the working class out of either of those parties. But yeah, the point remains, Democrats are not in a good place. So if you are a Democrat, there's reason to worry. I mean, the United States basically, I think, is locked in kind of a downward spiral, you know, just tailspin. Um, To me, the kind of gloves off moment, I mean... Obviously, Reagan in the 80s, about 40 years ago, you have the Gingrich Congress in the 90s and Bill Clinton as a right wing Democrat doing a lot of changes behind the scenes in the 90s. In the 2000s, you get the war on terror, just overt. Oh, hey, we torture people. You know, these kinds of overt embraces publicly of the worst kinds of imperialist cruelty, Uh, the 2008 crash. Anyway, we're now 40 years into a very reactionary process. And um, the entire system, there's no way out through the electoral system. Either way leads further down, okay? It's a problem because this, it means that conditions are gonna get worse for working people. And yet working people, I don't know when people are gonna realize en masse that we need to do something else And that simply pulling out of the system, while that's a step, you know, and not subscribing to either Democrat or Republican or Libertarian, which for that matter are worse, arguably, than either of them. They just have like less money and backing, Uh, but they're crazier. I mean, it'll result in worse neoliberalism if Libertarians get power. So anyway, pulling out of that entire system is step one. But you can't just like, you know, like an ostrich, put your head in the sand and like, oh, I can't see you. Therefore, you stopped existing. That's not how it works. You, you know, there could be three people still voting Democrat and Republican. Uh, if nobody else does anything, then they're going to stay in power. So that's kind of the point is um, we actually have to organize outside of this, build an independent left, etc. But yeah, I guess this is going to be an interview about all of the many ways in which Democrats are fucked because they're paid to lose by the 1% donors that uh, control both parties. And like I said, there's no way out for working people through either of these parties to the kind of society that we need to build. Both parties oppose socialism. Both parties stand in the way of ending capitalism. So those are things we need to do. And we need to break past these parties and oppose them, not try to improve them. So Anyway, yeah, I mean, she's not wrong. The Republican Party didn't go away when, uh, you know, Trump left office. His base is still there, and they will take the next Trump-like figure eagerly. And um, it's going to continue to be a problem because the Democrats offer nothing substantially different. And again, locked in a death spiral. Let's continue. A lot of problems that are in the way our system uh, infrastructure for electioneering is, uh, all the way from organizational to tactics to strategy that make it distinct from the Republican universe. And so those two things combined should have everybody concerned. So let's start with like the top level and then work to the specifics of this next election. There's this general idea that you have the control of the White House switch in one election and then in that next midterm, the party that takes control of the House, uh, I'm sorry, that takes control of the White House doesn't do well in the House, often losing. Now, it doesn't always happen, but it it happens frequently. What is there on top of that structural thing that may be specific to the current slate of Democrats and Republicans that concerns you for 22? Yeah, I mean, here, let me just say in terms of (laughs) in terms of what you just said about, you know, it doesn't always happen, but it happens frequently. Let me be very, very clear. The last 40 midterm cycles in 38 of them, the incumbent party suffered midterm loss. 
in the hyper polarized polarized era which is a you know if you think about soil periods or anthropology or something like that we're living in a very distinct behavior um pattern time period of hyper partisanship and polarization in that era we have seen these large midterm effects not that we've never seen large ones in history but we're seeing them kind of become the staple and of course that is because we have this uh, very very distinct um you know two-party coalition set up right now you know we didn't always have these two parties it took a long time for them to institutionalize and now they have these very institutionalized voting banks uh that are ideologically homogenous that are uh you know at least especially in the republican um format very um demographically homogenous and therefore you don't have like a midterm swing because people are like ah you know i tried a i tried coke and i'm like ah maybe i'll try pepsi right that's not so much of what's happening there is always some voters moving choice um you know who are going from a you know, coke to pepsi but what's really powering these large midterms is that the demographic composition of the electorate is, is switching. A lot of that switch, by the way, David, isn't coming from the right, okay? It comes from us um, participating and then pulling back, right? Um, and, you know, that's that's what I'm, I'm trying to head off. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. I A couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, um, we had a situation, like, you, like you're pointing out, 2020 was just ripe for Joe Biden to, to oust an incumbent everything went wrong under Trump. And then on top of that, you had this disastrous pandemic response. And still, while the popular yep. vote margin was big, um, it came down to relatively three hundred thousand votes in a few states the same way that it did in 2016. 2016 could have gone Hillary. 2020 could have gone Trump. Right. I imagine that with a Democrat in the White House, maybe now this is more a 24 conversation than 22. I don't think that Democrats will be as motivated to reelect Joe Biden or if it's Kamala Harris and Biden goes one term. And so I worry that Republicans will be reinvigorated by saying, let's get Trump back in. And that's a real concern to me. Is that concern warranted in your mind? That should make you guys all stay up at night like it does me. I mean, here I am days away out from a appendectomy and I'm, I'm doing the show today because it's so urgent that I. I OK, let me jump in again. If you want to get depressed in a hurry, start following U.S. electoral politics. Again, there's no way out for working people through either party. They will just hurt you unless you are, you know, a rich small business owner. Like not even like a uh, small, small business owner, but like a, a fairly wealthy small business owner. If you are like in the 93 percent neither party really is for you like at all and getting emotionally invested and hung up on exactly what they're talking about is going to do nothing for you in fact it's going to detract from more productive things that you could do with your time and um yeah just the Democratic Party is not something we control. So get that idea out of your head. Working people don't control the Democratic Party. You see what happened when the Bernie Sanders movement tried to do something in the Democratic Party. And I participated in that. And that should stand as proof everlasting. I mean, and it's not just Bernie Sanders either. As I mentioned here on the show, this has been going on. There's always some progressive candidate in the Democratic slate. They're always like the underdog and everybody's like, oh, what if so and so got it? Now, Bernie Sanders was the biggest one of those by far. And he also wasn't technically a Democrat. There were some unusual things about him that did really make him stand out and made that movement go further. I mean, one of them was the Internet. Honestly, that was part of it. Um, you know, and part of it's just the totally horrible economic situation that we're in. Like people are ready for more change. So more people were attracted to it. And young people coming up are facing very few options. I mean, it's like trying to go to school, trying to get a house. Things are not good, to say the least. So it was like, yeah, is there some way out of this? Well, you know, we see what happens when you try to work within the Democratic Party. You get fucked 
And then all that time and energy and money goes to waste. So thinking that we have some say in the Democratic Party, we don't. So if you really want this cycle to end, the only way to do it is by taking the government away from the Democratic and Republican and whatever other bourgeois parties that the 1% wants to throw at us, libertarians or whatever. Um, that's not going to work. So there's a reason this is a Marxist-Leninist channel. Go read Lenin's The State and Revolution. That's, if you're new to Marxism, I would say read that first because it tends to be the most commonly asked questions explained in a fairly straightforward manner. It will blow your mind and you will come away from that reading with a much widened perspective on the bourgeois state, the cap cap capitalism works in government and imperialism and everything. You will just come away from it a changed person. I have it on the channel. Go check it out. So we have this revolving door of Democrats and Republicans and things just seem to get worse and worse and worse. That's by design. They've been privatizing, deregulating and just lowering working conditions and living standards for the working people of the U.S., and they've been expanding wars to the working people of other countries for decades now. So clearly, neither of these parties is the solution. They're both the problem. And anyone interested in breaking from that, you know, who's ready to see that breaking from this system is the only option. Well, here you go. But so from that perspective, let's continue to watch this conversation of just spinning wheels about how the Democrats aren't doing enough and the Republicans are crazy and they're going to overpower the Democrats. You know, it's like watching a cycle of abuse in a family or something. It's just it's horrific to behold and everyone witnessing it becomes a victim as well. So the only thing you really can do pull out become part of the independent left, and then get organized. There is something going on in your area. Get involved with it and do whatever you can. But the system, God help us, will crush us. Don't contribute to it. Back to the video. Tell as many people as possible and turn as many people as possible onto it. The solution yeah. it's not like, okay, we have this problem and you're getting a lot of oxygen about that in the media. But the solution is is as equally, I mean, it's more important, right? And the yeah. solution, of course, if we can implement it here, isn't so much, it isn't just about having the policy power. Um, it is about staving off potentially democratic collapse. So, you know, it, it, it's just so critical that people understand on that other side, they think they're the good guys. Yeah. Okay. They think we're the bad guys because they're fed all of this um, hyper-partisan, you know, red meat, it's constant crisis and threat, right? And so what the things that they're doing over there to dismantle democracy, they would tell you are in defense of it. And they believe that. And we all know objectively that that's not true. We so I got to jump in. First of all, you're both part of the problem, Democrats and Republicans. And the Democratic Party has been throwing the Green Party off the ballot wherever they can for ages. So fuck you. You know... This whole thing of we're better than the Republicans, where has that gotten you? It's gotten you to this fucking video. It's gotten you to this video where you're crying about that you're on the brink of democratic collapse. It's not working. It's never worked. You know, they tried anybody but Bush back in 2004. It didn't work. Bush won. Kerry lost. You can't run candidates who offer nothing and expect to win. And indeed, the 1% controllers of the Democratic Party know exactly what they're doing. They're not just out of touch, they're managing their system. Theirs, not ours. They wanted Bush Cheney, they got them. So this whole notion that the Democratic Party is some kind of fighting defender and, you know, oh, those Republicans, they're just so mean, we just can't, you know, it really is that Simpsons meme of like, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. Literally. I mean, it just, that's it in a nutshell. They've been doing a failed strategy 
over and over and over again. At some point, we in the audience need to realize this is on purpose and it's never going to change. And hopeless people like this, you know, still saying, oh, we got to fix it. No, you're not going to fix it. You're not going to fix it. You won't fix it. You know, you look at what they did to Bernie Sanders, for example, and he was a pretty weak candidate. And you still look at what they did to him anyway. It's just um, hopeless. It's, it's, it's never going to work. You're a working person and you want your interests reflected. Forget the Democratic Party. I don't care, you know, oh, like all the other parties are small or, or we have to build something from the ground up. You literally have a better chance of doing that than you do of getting change through the Democratic Party. I know that's not what you want to hear, but it's reality. And if we get confused, we can look at international audiences to find out, are we doing groupthink or are we actually right? You know, and, and, it's, and it's absolutely the case that they, they are going to be on fire to put Donald Trump back in that White House. They are going to be on fire to flip Congress as we were when we felt the threat of their in-party power. Right. And, um, you know, the Democrats' hope is that, oh, if Biden's relatively personally popular, if we do a couple of these big packages, things will just be fine. And that's, you know, that was not an unreasonable hope in 1990 or maybe even in the early 2000s. But yeah. not now, because we have a distinct behavior in the electorate, as you just pointed out, as shit show as Donald Trump's term in office was, you know, everything on hyper um, drive, but also different too, because it wasn't abstract stuff that we care about. It was pandemic is coming to kill you, your family, take all your stuff, you know, kill your, um, you know, personal wealth, everything, right? And if you still end up with the same contest I told you you would end up with yeah. 16 months before the election, almost to the letter I said, this is exactly how 2020 will play out. That means something's really wrong with your political system because when a giant stimulus comes in like that, there should be reaction, right? Like the thing that we should have seen in a healthy, if, a, if, if politics didn't need to change from the 80s and the 90s, then we wouldn't have seen a um, you know repeat of 2016 and not a 1980 Reagan Carter shellacking, right? Hey, That's how what did, now along those lines, is. I mean, when you talk about policy and all, all these different things, the Republican Party is not really a party of policy anymore. It's communism and socialism are going to take over. Mitch McConnell is great because he stops Democrats from doing things. I'm going to jump in here. David's still talking, but I've said before on the channel that you can't analyze the Democratic or the Republican parties in isolation. They work together to rule the United States of America and, you know, the major military arm of global imperialism, etc. They work together. If you want to say that the Republicans aren't a party of policy um, and the Democrats mainly are a party of we're not the Republicans, you can basically say that the Democrats also are not a party of policy. The Democrats are there to stop the actual left and they're there to say, well, it could be worse. You could get the Republicans. It's like saying, you know, oh, I only stabbed you with a uh, pocket knife. I could have stabbed you with the machete. Well, thanks. No, no, not thanks. Fuck you to both of them. You know, neither one is acceptable or appropriate. The Democratic Party has done more to stop socialism, arguably, than the Republicans have. Though, again, it's they work hand in hand with each other on behalf of many of the same people and certainly the same overall class. They both represent the same class. The capitalist class rules America through the Democratic Party and through the Republican Party. The working class is ruled by these parties. We are not doing the ruling. We do not have a party. Let me say that again. We do not have a party. So everything they're saying, if you're a working class person, it really doesn't apply to you. These are two factions of the 1% fighting with each other or pretending to. 
It's kind of an elaborate puppet show. And yeah, some people believe it's real. Whatever. For those people, it is real. And, you know, it'll take on a little life of its own here and there. Overall, it is one big illusion designed to keep you distracted from fighting for your own interests. Show me where the Democratic Party has done anything significant policy-wise that wasn't a direct response to either fervent demands from the left, which then, of course, got mutilated by the time the Democrats implemented some empty shell version of them, or that wasn't just a changing of the guard, you know, part of the ceremonies of switching back and forth with the Republicans. They're not a party of policy either, and watching these two people congratulate each other on how great their party is, while at the same time, they're terrified of, you know, complete system collapse that their party is governing. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> I guess that's why we're here to kind of point that out and poke at that with our stick. Like, it's super fucking glaringly obvious. Continuing. Uh, critical race theory, etc. So how, how do you run against that? How do you run if, if you're it, how did what do Democrats need to do? Right. That's the frustrating part is, is it's really easy to run against that, but not if you're tinkering sh in the in the le in the limbs of the tree. OK, like our, their system is built like that. Like they've built and Michael Steele was you know, me and him and I are like tandem. Um, he was on TV last night on, on Brian Williams, the show. Yeah. Trying to explain to people, look, this is a like we go in there and we we just decimate your brand like we the reason they don't need policy or uh, achievements and i tweeted about this last night right. is that it's not to to the electorate that sees their shit. it's not even about here's a or b it's about b sucks so much that it is going to come and is going to drink the, the the blood of your children right i mean that's the shit they're getting over there right so like what strike pack is is i mean it's many things is a strategic revolution it's a tactical deployment revolution but it's also i mean most critically it's a messaging revolution because it takes the convert like the the whole thing away from this oh should we mobilize the base or persuade independence because that's a that that's a it doesn't matter what the answer is a or b because that's not the world we live in right now and and it and it readjusts the whole thing for the root up to a branding war, right? And in when you're in that posture, you want to be putting them on defense. And the right. way to do that isn't to defend yourself against CRT and P and defend the police and all this shit. It doesn't matter if we could disappear everybody that ever held that position, they would still brand every candidate from the moderate, moderate, all the way down as a defund the police socialist. That's what they'll do to Val Demings. We, we already know what they're gonna do. Right. So like you can't escape that label. What you can do is go on an offense with them and make them own. And, and the nice thing is you don't have to distort shit. like no Democrat wants to defund the police. But now the whole party is ascribed to this position. Yeah. On the Republican side, the things that we're attacking them for are things are doing. They're the real things that everybody supports that are, you know, the party's congressional leadership are doing. And you, know, you don't even have to get hyperbolic, even though it sounds hyperbolic. It's just the facts. Right. And so you make it so that the electorate has to choose in, in South Florida. OK, so. OK, I got to stop her here before she says anything else. I keep thinking I know what she's saying. And then she says something else that I'm like, wait a minute. Um, so it sounded like she at first I thought she was saying don't get into a branding war. Then I think she was saying get into a branding war. And he's like, right, right. I'm like, what do you mean? Right. Did you notice she didn't mention actually offering people something a single fucking time? In fact, the only time she mentioned a policy was, quote, no Democrat wants to defund the police, meaning we live in a fucking police state and police are killing people and they're completely unaccountable. And people, working people, your base, want that problem addressed and solved. Okay? Defund the police is one slogan having to do with addressing some amount of accountability around the completely unaccountable police gangs who run large areas of this country without any accountability. 
people want a solution to that problem because they're watching their friends and loved ones die because of it or live in terror. They want a solution to that. You're literally just laughed it off. Anyway, this is so obvious, but leave it to this, you know, self-proclaimed elections expert to lead you to more fucking failures. You know, and then unfortunately, the candidates from like the DSA backed people, the AOCs and like other people like that, there's real limits on what you can do because you're a Democrat. So that's not really a route either, even for the few people you manage to sneak into the party, it doesn't work in the end. So if those are the kinds of changes you would like to see, we need to build another avenue. This has been done in other countries with viable socialist movements that have taken power and we need to do it in the USA. I don't know how successful that can be on what timeline, but I guarantee you this, Aiming as low as they're talking is a recipe for failure. And if you want even the tiniest concession, you need to set your goal as revolution. Anything worthwhile that has been won for the working class has been won by extreme radicals in the labor movement and the socialist movement and the communist movement, etc. That's who drove left politics. And then the fucking Democrats come along and co-opt it and they claim that as their legacy when it's not. And FDR was opposed by a lot of his own. I mean, he was a one percenter. He just wanted more class peace. He didn't want to end capitalism. He wanted to save it. And that's what he did. But even then, he was opposed by other capitalist factions in the party. And as soon as he was gone, they started backtracking from the New Deal and any kind of, you know, class-based politics as rapidly as possible towards liberal individualized rights and, and that kind of framework. Anyway, uh, it's so just, my God, you know, she starts off this interview, this, this person he's interviewing, making some amount of sense and then just winds up making all the same errors again. It's just like, I, it kind of sounds like she's saying we they need to be like snarkier and they get need to get you know more into the branding thing. If you don't actually solve people's problems, it doesn't matter. And let me add something to that. Are the Republicans solving the problems that working class Republicans, fools as they may be, face in their lives? No, they're not solving their actual problems. They are solving their perceived problems. Ah, that's how they get their support. So you get all these people listening to Fox News and everything else. Fox News tells you what the problem is. It's a complete lie. It's wrong. But they convince a lot of people who are susceptible to that kind of messaging and manipulation. So then you have all these people thinking the problem is X. And then the Republican Party, and they're wrong. It's not reality-based in any way. Then the Republican Party says, I will solve these problems. And then all the people say, yeah, solve the problems. Well, so Democratic voters, it doesn't work quite the same way. Democratic voters tend to be more reality-based, like working people wanting higher wages or something like that. So solving their problems, i.e. delivering on improving people's lives and that kind of thing, the kind of thing that, you know, I mean, that's the kind of thing that people turn to politics for, for practical solutions to problems that they're facing. It's a lot harder to hoodwink people who are more class conscious working people, you know, about, oh, hey, I solved your problem. Well, no, you didn't. You know, it doesn't work the same way. And this isn't 100% of Democrats and 100% of Republicans. But I think you know what I'm getting at. Is people on the left are a little more tuned into reality. Uh, we may, you know, have differences over tactics or this or that. But, 
and I'm not trying to call Democrats left. I'm saying that the Democratic Party attracts some people on the left to, you know, every so often vote for them or get involved, you know, holding their nose or whatever. But the idea is that while Republicans are very adept at, you know, manipulating their base and feeding them complete false versions of reality and then solving those false problems for them and that works there, it doesn't work in the same way for people who are left wing. It doesn't work the same way. You have to actually solve their problems. Hope that's clear. Let's get back to this grading interview. Socialism, right? Oh boy, don't give me a $300 child care tax credit. Um, or military coup, right? You pick South Florida. Because I can tell you this, down in South Florida, those populations are afraid of socialism. Yeah. They're in the South America. But you know what else they're afraid of? Right-wing military coups. Mm. Because if you look at South American history and what has destabilized, destabilized South America just as much is like the Republican Party has cooking right now in the lab. Yeah, I mean, I think the complexity in South Florida, I was just down there. Okay, so who does this appeal to? What they're talking about right now? I mean, you just heard the, you know, the horseshoe theory of like, South Americans are equally afraid of communism and right wing fascist, you know, anti-communism. Could it be? Could it be that the base of people that you are talking to is just not big enough to reliably win elections? Is that possible? Is it possible that the people with whom that message you just said actually resonates is tiny and actually the number of people who don't vote uh or you know hold their nose and sometimes vote democrat but not reliably actually would gain a lot more like they don't get that much out of the system and would actually gain a lot more from entirely scrapping this system and in fact are ready to try something like that is bigger could it be that you very comfortable people speaking to and on behalf of other very comfortable people just aren't a majority? Could it be that your politics fall flat with working people? It's a possibility because we stand to gain more from scrapping the system than with keeping it. And increasingly, you know, this whole squabbling, it just sounds like one big right wing Din, continuing is uh, Cuban Americans don't care about you know right wing military involvement. They like it and and they want it to go into Cuba. Uh, Other being from Argentina myself and having a sense of the different the different groups there. That's complex. Let me ask you this: intuitively, it seems to me that a lot of Trump's twenty four potential is based on whether he can successfully play kingmaker in twenty two whether Marjorie Taylor Greene gets reelected, whether oh, Lauren yes. Boebert gets reelected, et cetera. Is that an accurate assessment or does that not, not really matter? No, I mean- Before she says anything, let me just say about these like questions of particular personalities. They don't matter. Before Lauren Boebert, we didn't know Lauren Boebert. And then there she was. Before Marjorie Taylor Greene, we didn't know Marjorie Taylor Greene. And then there she was. It doesn't matter. The system and the mass movements underlying these different factions will cough up. You know, uh, the metaphor I like is mushrooms. The mushroom that you see, you know, the mushroom that has the cap and all that stuff, is actually just the fruiting body of a large, mostly hidden underground mass, or it's in a tree or whatever, of mycelium, which is like undifferentiated mushroom matter. The mushroom you see is literally just the tip of the iceberg. It's just something that the mycelial network coughed up. These politicians are the same thing. They're just a product of something much bigger than they are. Stop thinking about these individual politicians. But this is the nature. It's so aggravating listening to this. I really, this video is just confirming a hundred times over my contempt for the Democratic Party. Um, 
choosing to totally ignore what's going on under the surface and then and then just looking at oh you know how do we get this politician to beat this politician it's just oh my god it's just like how this will just go on for you know the country can literally be burning to the ground they'll still have this conversation they'll be like oh hold on david um you know my ceiling's on fire let me just uh yeah let me just stand over here okay now to answer your question you know it'll just keep going on till the bitter end um you know if that's what you want stay invested if you don't go read state and revolution uh i think it's a good starting place continuing partially david because marjorie taylor green and bobart are i mean that's the thing is like it's you know it's so hard to like have this like encyclopedic knowledge of the apparatus of how elections actually work and all that matters in a race is you know what percent of Republican voters and their left and their Indies, Indie mm. leaners, are going to be voting in that electorate versus the other side? So like when you look at a, a district like Bobards or uh, especially Greens, they're they're not ever getting tossed out of that seat, right? Uh, they're drawn; those districts are not drawn in a competitive way. E- but, even so, from even because, from a Republican challenge, you think that they're good for as long as they want those seats? Oh yeah, they're never going to beat back. I mean, you're not going to go chart. No, it, I, I mean, even after the Holocaust, I mean, the horrible offensive stuff with the Jewish, the vaccine patches. Yeah. I'm telling you, Mar- Marjorie Taylor Greene, it's like trying to go primary AOC on our side. And I know guys, like as soon as I say, oh, they're not the same, then they're not. And they're nothing alike. OK. Yeah. But the one way that they are in like is that they serve in districts that are not drawn to be competitive between the parties. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, they have these distinctly ideological electorates that they satisfy. Um, and, you know, so so the question is this, the, you know, the, the answer to your question is this, like, OK, you're not going to be those two. And so you don't want to turn them into symbolic, um, you know, um, le- you know, measurements. Uh, but it is true that if we can hold I mean, we beat back the midterm fundamentals here. And we keep Donald Trump from being even in contention to become Speaker of the House because that's the plan, guys. I mean, yep. you know, Speaker of the House doesn't come have to come. It's never been true that they've been so rude to their own membership that they would go recruit an outsider. To yeah, be yeah, yeah. But the rules are there. And if McCarthy thinks for one second, one second that Donald Trump isn't doesn't have an, his eye on that speakership, especially since he's banished out in, in basically that Superman world where they put the villains out in space and they're rotating out in that space. That's where Trump is. His only point to come back into the public debate every day and to, and in a way that they have to cover him, they don't have a choice, is that speakership. Okay, Because otherwise he's going to stay over, at least to some degree, the media is aware of how like they, they're culpable in his rise and his tenure, right? So like they're not going to just open the door to him but if he breaks it down, right? So you re- Okay, so she's still going on with whatever she's saying. Let me just pause and ask you a simple question. This electoral system she is describing. Find me the part of this that is appealing to anyone, but to you. I I don't actually listen to this description and say, "Huh, what a great system." I don't even think it sounds remotely functional or interesting or appealing in any way. This is a system we should entirely scrap and replace with something different that works for workers. Continuing. Really everything. I mean, they have the physical power, the like the legal power to not certify elections if they take control in 2022. Right. Um, I mean, I don't know anybody watching this party could come to the, any other conclusion than that their intel, goal is to fight 24, do their best to win it, and then if they don't win it, win it anyway. <laughs> right? Yeah, as we've yeah. seen them uh, uh, claim from 2 a.m. on, you know, no, November of 2020, that also is it's crazy to call it a strategy, but it's a tactic, at least, I guess I guess we could say. Um, oh, for them? No, it's not crazy to call it a strategy, OK, because this is something that got articulated, as did mm. the election narrative that Trump, the big, media, oh, Trump's big lie, bull- it was the whole Republican Party's big lie. And they began to seed its antecedents months before November of 2020. And they put all of this legwork in place, that if so that they could get tight margins in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, right. that they, A, 
preventing those ballots from arriving and getting counted until election night ballots came, which were anticipated to disproportionately break for Trump. So that they were creating strategically a situation on election night where Trump would be ahead in the vote, vote count. The other ballots have been blocked, at least from that initial night of coverage. Right. And then they could contest in court. Now, it ended up a wrinkle in that plan because the margins were large, just large enough in Wisconsin and, and large enough in PA and Wisconsin and Michigan to, to make that really hard. And still, what did they do? They went for it, right? Never make any single mistake as, as hot messes. They okay, whatever. Um, the thing that's standing out to me as she's going on about all this stuff and while well, they both are the 2000 election, this is not new. And Democrats have had 20 years to cope with all this stuff and come up with a strategy, and they have just chosen not to. So fuck them, because, you know, ultimately it's all of us who, you know, things, the violence always gets pushed down onto the workers, the people with the least power. And um, Democrats couldn't be bothered to do anything about it. Go back to the 2000 election. What they're describing is exactly what happened in Florida, exactly what happened in Florida. And the Supreme Court handed George W. Bush the election. This has been going on for 20 years. The, the, this has been a known thing. The Democrats won't acknowledge it. You know, I used to wonder why. Now I know they just work with the Republicans on behalf of financial interests. But you know, having these people sit there and mystify their audience about all this stuff, it's a giant disservice. And this is what being inside of the system fucking does to you is you just go around in circles. Oh, it's not fair. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Pull out. You become a Marxist. Yes, it takes some reading. It takes some learning. But you can get out of the system and you can reorient yourself and you can stop wasting your time and energy and investment in believing in a party that isn't there to help you. Whichever party you were part of, it's not there to help you. Anyway, on the 2000 thing, there was a documentary, I think it's called Unprecedented, the story of the 2000 election. I think that was one of the ones, there were, there were a few. But I mean, it's like what they're talking about with Trump being so singular and unusual and whatever. No, this has been the Republican Party strategy for wherever they could get away with it for 20 fucking years. So wake up. I mean, now's the time, you know. Anyway, let's finish this out. There's just a couple of minutes left. They are over there. The thing that they are looping us on is strategic planning and implementation of those plans. They're, they, you know, as we're, I call us walking dead zombies. We're kind of stumbling along until the next human sets off human activity. And then we're like, oh, we should go deal with that, right? <laughs> they're over there like velociraptors. They're yeah. planning shit and they're executing it on. And now... We can't afford to be we can't afford to be aimless, and so really that strategic um, overhaul. I mean, we, we're better on issues, we're better on policy and all the wonky shit. But guys, like the environment that we're in, what we, the one thing we're not better on is strategy and war making, and we damn well better fix it quick. Yeah, a point I made earlier on uh, on today's podcast. Rachel Bittacoffer, election forecaster, analyst, host of the Election Whisperer podcast and also the founder of Strike Pack. Rachel, always a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, and I urge everybody go to Strike Pack's website, see what these messaging that's brand offensive branding messaging looks like. And if you can support us. Yeah, uh, I would not suggest that. And again, it does sound like she's just championing offensive or aggressive branding as like the way out of this. I just no. <laughs> You know, uh, you would need a substantial change in what the Democratic Party is doing. You know, why is it that they're all standing around like zombies? You had the Bernie Sanders coalition that was substantially doing something different. The Democratic Party couldn't destroy it fast enough. So that's what you're going to get out of the Democratic Party. Um, I've done other videos about Bernie Sanders. I think he's a poor leader who should have told the Democrats to fuck off after 2016 and gone third party, either Green Party or form your own party. You were filling stadiums and you just fucking threw that away or rather you channeled it into the Democratic Party, which is basically the same as, you know, and then the Democrats threw it away for you. Um, you know, 
this is what happens. So we've seen when we let the regular Democrats run things, we've seen what happens when, you know, pro progressive Democrats try to do things. Uh, it's not going to work. If you want to get out of the system, you need just a hard break from capitalism, period. That's it. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you want to get your name on the screen, patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Otherwise, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting all help to boost the channel as well. Uh, we're going to keep up the marathon of hanging with the Sock Dem gang clips, frustrating as they may be. Uh, actually, what she was saying about getting Trump as Speaker of the House I have another story on that from the Ring of Fire that I will do a little bit of criticism on. And uh, yeah, we will see you in the next video. Thanks.